We're joined by Bruce Carruthers, John D. MacArthur Chair in Sociology at Northwestern University. His books include Money and Credit, which analyzes the foundation of consumer and corporate credit markets. His current projects include a study of the historical evolution of credit as a problem in the sociology of trust. In 2016, Bruce was the McGuire Chair in Ethics in American History at the John W. Kluge Center. Sarah Binder is Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institute and Professor of Political Science at George Washington University, where she specializes in Congress and legislative politics. Binder's current research explores the historical and contemporary relationship between Congress and the Federal Reserve. And she's co-author of The Myth of Independence, How Congress Governs the Federal Reserve. Sarah currently is the Kluge Chair in American Law and Governance. Sebastian Malaby is the Paul A. Volcker Senior Fellow in International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also a contributing columnist for the Washington Post where he previously served as a staff columnist and also as a editorial staff member. He is the author of The Man Who Knew the Life and Times of Alan Greenspan. That book won the 2016 Financial Times McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. Welcome to you all. Bruce, we're gonna start with you. There's a lot of focus these days on the key role that the Fed plays in addressing economic problems of great severity like we're experiencing now. But what role did the Fed have historically, traditionally in economic crisis? Um, well, thank you for uh, including me in this conversation. Um, the Fed was founded in 1913, and originally it was designed to deal with banking and financial crises. In fact, it was uh, founded in the wake of the 1907 crisis. Uh, and in the background, politically, were the populist era monetary politics that uh, helped shape uh, the deliberations that led up to its establishment. And so uh, we get this uh, strange federated structure where there are 12 regional Federal Reserve banks that were each owned by their member banks and so on. Um, and they were dealing with a real problem that is in the late 19th century and early 20th century, there really were a lot of bank failures and financial crises in that period. And when the Fed was established, uh, its chief policy instrument was a thing called the discount window. And what the discount window uh, allowed was member banks could bring their commercial paper uh, to the discount window and get liquidity in a crisis. And so really the goal was to create what they called in those days an elastic currency uh, that could stretch uh, to accommodate uh, the demand for more liquidity in a crisis. And so uh, it was very much a acute financial crisis um, uh, oriented uh, institution. Um, and of course, because it was organized in this strange federated structure, uh, decisive coordinated action was difficult at the very beginning. Uh, but the circumstances uh, changed almost immediately with World War I uh, because the U.S. federal government, uh, like all the other uh, participating uh, governments in World War I, suddenly had to borrow massive amount of money and sell government bonds. And so uh, American financial markets were flooded with government debt. And what the Fed discovered was that by buying and selling government securities, they could actually influence uh, monetary conditions in the U.S., and so a new policy instrument was sort of accidentally born, and that's what we now call uh, open market operations. And there's a, you know, the FOMC, uh, the Federal uh, Open Markets uh, Committee, is now the body within the Fed that decides how to conduct open market operations. But that was kind of an accident. It wasn't uh, baked into the architecture of the system uh, at the get-go. Um, now, uh, the Fed prioritizes price stability, and which is a very, very traditional uh, goal for a central bank. It prioritizes employment, uh, and of course, it continues to prioritize the stability of the financial system. Uh, so its goals have evolved over time. Sebastian, what are some of the newer approaches that the Fed has used, and why have they made some of these innovations? Sure. Well, if we pick up on the history that was just being laid out, uh, roughly uh, the early history the First World War and thereafter. The continuing story is one of constant evolution. We sometimes think of the Fed as the possessor of some static, technocratic you know, secrets of the temple, uh, which never has to change. But the reality is that 
if you think about the Second World War, the Fed was primarily concerned with financing this huge government debt. Um, then in the Korean War in 1951, uh, the Fed switched and refused to accommodate uh, the national debt as its priority and instead started to focus on the stability of prices, in other words, fighting inflation. I'd say that inflation stability was the priority until the late 60s, and then there was a period when political strong arming by successive presidents, uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Richard Nixon in particular, um, pushed the Fed into uh, responding to political pressure and allowing inflation to pick up. So that's why you have the double digit inflation of the late uh, 70s. Then there's a backlash against that and the Fed goes monetarist. In other words, it targets a fixed supply of money that lasts only for three years from 79 to 82 in the early period under Paul Volcker's chairmanship. Then you have a bit of ad hocery for a while, and then the gradual emergence of what was called inflation targeting from the mid 90s and onwards. And now we're maybe into a new period when inflation targeting is being somewhat relaxed. Um, full employment is becoming more of a priority. And, uh, and then in the background, we have questions which perhaps we'll get to about financial stability. Sarah, so, so you have a situation of a crisis like we have now and, uh, and, and an extended economic downturn. Other institutions of government uh, get into the economic policy game. Does the Fed mesh with these in any way or, or is there any coordination? I mean, what happens in, in that sense? Well, um, I think it's important to, as we sort of all have hinted at, there's this sort of notion, I would call it a myth, but a notion of the Fed's independence, that it takes these actions that Bruce and Sebastian have described, um, independent and autonomous from policymakers in Congress uh, and Treasury. Um, but the more you look at, especially what we've seen in the last, uh, certainly the last decade and certainly in the last six months with the CARES Act in the wake of the pandemic, um, it drives home that the Fed is making monetary policy enmeshed in sitting in the middle of the political system. And I would encourage us to think rather of uh, the Fed being independent in making and contributing to economic policy, but rather being interdependent with the support of these other institutions. It seemed pretty clearly in the Fed's relationship with Congress uh, at Ben Bernanke's uh, last uh, press conference before he handed the baton to incoming Fed Chair Janet Yellen, one of the, one of the questions was, well, do you have any advice uh, for Janet Yellen in dealing with uh, the legislature? And he says, Congress is our boss, right? Why did he say that? He, he said that really because I think Bernanke came to understand if he didn't as appreciate as much going in, but he certainly came to understand that hard, tough policy choices of the Fed need political support. And the risk is, and we see that I think in Dodd-Frank in the wake of the financial crisis, the risk is that Congress comes back and clips the powers of the Fed if it doesn't like the way it's exercising its, its lending powers. Or potentially, as we see, also see in Dodd-Frank, sometimes Congress can give the Fed more responsibility, responsibilities it might not want. And so there's an incentive for the Fed, even in the moments where, like the Volcker Fed, where we think he was truly independent, even in those episodes, there is some outside antennae or up understanding that they need to secure uh, political support in order for markets and businesses to understand that the Fed's going to have the credibility and the gumption to go ahead and do what it says it's, it's going to do. Now, now, more recently, uh, since the, the 2008 crisis, um, the Fed's taken on what I think may have been innovations, quantitative easing. Uh, we've seen economic conditions where the debt, particularly now, is at levels that people thought, at one point at least, thought were unsustainable and, and maybe weren't consistent with, manage, with a manageable inflation rate. Um, but we're seeing low inflation at the same time as the debt has skyrocketed with respect to the to the GDP. I mean, I don't know who wants to speak to that. Maybe Bruce or Sebastian or both um, and let Sarah chime in. Um, what do you all think about that? Um, well, I, 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 maybe I'll chime in first. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we are learning uh, that the, the, the macroeconomic effect of the 
national debt may not be as you know catastrophic as uh, some people had predicted, and it doesn't necessarily unleash inflation. And so uh, that has allowed uh, the Fed today to kind of have enough space to start to say uh, we're going to prioritize employment a little bit more um, and not just be focused uh, relentlessly on on uh, price stability. Um, and they've also, uh, I guess, learned that. A little bit of inflation is maybe not such a bad thing. Uh, so, uh, so zero inflation is really not something that anyone is is seeking. Uh, maybe we can live with two uh, percent as a sort of a long run. But, but certainly uh, there was um, there's sort of changing politics of the of the federal deficit, and and right now we are in a world where that that debt has exploded upwards, and and the wheels aren't falling off yet. And so, um, you know. And this is a lesson that's being learned not only by the Fed, uh, uh, but also by all the other kind of constituents, the political constituents who are looking at the Fed. And so there's less of a of a kind of uh, you know sky is falling uh, cry uh, going around uh, the political classes uh, because people are looking at what's actually unfolding in front of them, and it and it really isn't um, quite uh, quite so uh, worrisome. You know, I think it's worth keeping in mind that just as we've all emphasized that the idea of Fed independence is a bit of a myth and can be exaggerated, so too the idea that the Fed has sort of complete control over inflation uh, is an exaggeration. Uh, in the last resort, I think the Fed can control inflation, but it can be surprised uh, between today and that last resort. And that's a pretty important point when we talk about the national debt. You know, the national debt is sustainable at this historically high level um, in the kind of COVID economy, but it's only sustainable because interest rates are so low that servicing that national debt is relatively cheap, right? So the stock of national debt um, since the early 90s has uh, gone up a lot, but the cost of servicing it has fallen. Um, and that's because of these low interest rates. Now, the interest rates can be low because inflation is low, and so you don't need high interest rates to constrain inflation. <laughs> what if inflation were to pick up, not because of something the Fed did, but maybe because workers start to bargain harder, because trade might be interrupted, globalization might be interrupted. Uh, all manner of things could lead to bottlenecks in supply uh, and therefore to higher prices. And the Fed can't precisely predict all of that. So I think... The risk in this high debt environment is that we get a, a, an inflation surprise where inflation does come back to bite. The Fed is forced to raise interest rates and all of a sudden servicing that big debt becomes expensive. Mm -hmm. Sarah, did you want to add anything? Um, the only thing I would add is that I think the lesson of the last, I guess, 12 plus years since the financial crisis is that the whatever the cause, whether it's financial crisis, whether it's now a pandemic, right? That this this combination, chronically low inflation, interest rates at the zero lower bound, meaning unless the Fed is willing to go to negative uh, interest rates, they're really stuck there with their interest rate lever. That that combination demands a sort of more interdependent monetary and fiscal policy toolkit. I mean, in some way, and I guess we'll get to the, the CARES Act for congressional response to the pandemic. That's what you see, right? Whenever we've seen now Mnuchin and, and Jay Powell, the Treasury Secretary and the Fed Chair testifying, they're often at that table together because the way Congress directed the Fed to do more lending uh, and into different corners of the economy was to yoke them to Treasury to, in essence, to have them think about uh, how much lending is really going to going to take place because Congress basically provided five hundred billion dollar backstop to encourage more lending. So I I think that gets us to this world again where the Fed's immediate challenge and its historic challenge almost has been less about controlling inflation and what do you do about deflation? Right to go to Bruce's point about the origins of the Fed in financial crisis, that that is really. Um, without diminishing the amount of time they spend uh, worrying and trying to control inflation, subject to Sebastian's caveat, um, but really deflation and the difficulty of engineering growth and jobs is 
first uh, historically paramount, but certainly paramount to many most lawmakers' concerns because they get reelected on on stronger growth and, and more jobs. You, you know, the um, a lot of people consider us to be in a situation where where we're in a political crisis, frankly, in the United States, and and uh, and that accelerated um, beginning maybe in two thousand eight. And uh, government took big actions then, whether it was the uh, Troubled Asset Relief Program, known as TARP, or the actions the Fed it took then and continued to take, and uh, actions that are happening this year. And out there on so-called Main Street, the notion is, well, a lot of people are getting r- very rich and doing very well, but these government institutions, maybe in particular the Fed, but other ones too, uh, seem to not really be addressing the needs of more ordinary folks. Um, that's kind of a, I don't know if that's really in the form of a question, but it's certainly an issue we face. What can the Fed do or what can political institutions, political institutions and um, Congress and the president do to address that question? Anybody really? Uh, we, I said the word trust in there, so maybe that's Bruce's uh, category. All right. Well, I'll I'll charge in, and then and then the other two people can uh, bail me out. Um, so uh, I I think there are a number of other issues that are kind of hovering around the Fed, uh, and that are certainly part of the national political conversation, and that you know animate politics today, and and which are not traditionally part of the Fed's remit. Um, and so one of the questions is how much do these bleed into what the Fed thinks it it, it can do and should do. I would say that the uh, the inequality story, uh, you know, which are uh, which is a longstanding trend over many decades and across many administrations, uh, the level of economic inequality has been growing in the United States for a long time, and and that is obviously uh, you know something that comes out of the functioning of our market economy, and and whether it, the Fed should worry about that and how it could worry about that is is a sort of an open question. Um, but, but certainly if people thought, well, we should, you know, we should do something about inequality, um, then, you know, the Fed is sort of one of the major, you know, economic instruments of government policy. And so some people might think, well, okay, let's see what the Fed could do with this and, and let's try to translate inequality into its kind of uh, uh, world. Uh, a second issue, I think, that um, it, it kind of hovers on the uh, around um, is climate change. And so uh, I, I think this is something where the chairman uh, uh, has actually raised the issue. Uh, climate change is, is going to be enormously economically disruptive and, and it, it will involve huge losses. Uh, you just need to look at, you know, what's going to happen on the coastal areas and what's, what's happening in California with the fires and what's happening to agriculture with, with, uh, with uh, uh, climate change. There's going to be huge economic shocks. And so, uh, the Fed may well decide that acknowledging or thinking about climate change could be uh, part of its remit simply because the economic consequences of climate change are going to be so disruptive and it will turn into the things that the Fed uh, normally worries about. Uh, and then the final uh, thing I think is a little bit of a tweak on the inequality question. Uh, you know, there's different ways to slice inequality and one is simply, uh, you know, in a uh, thumbnail uh, sketch. It's like what what's happening to the rest of us is the one percent do better and better and better. So it's simply a an economic difference. Uh, but those economic inequalities are also translated into social inequalities, uh, like the difference between uh, um, whites and blacks in, in the United States. And so Black Lives Matter, as we know, is a very uh, uh, energetic uh, political movement right now, and it's posing the question of whether the economic growth uh, that the Fed is in charge of, uh, whether the benefits of that economic growth are being are being fairly shared uh, between our uh, minority populations and other populations. And so there's a question of, well, should the Fed uh, take a role there? Should they also worry about social inequalities and not just sort of a, in an abstract way, economic inequalities? And I'm not saying that I'm not advocating in favor of this uh, I'm just simply pointing out that these are issues that are kind of hovering around and and some of them um, will will uh, continue to animate American politics 
Um, and, and it's inevitable uh, that the question of whether the Fed should also get caught up in these politics and try to do something about it and whether politicians or the population at large will uh, expect them to try to do something about it, uh, I think that's, that's going to be in the next, um, the next period of time. Um, either of you want to chime in, Sebastian? Sure, it, it, it's, it's a tricky balance because um, you argue that already the Fed is subject to excessive expectations, that people think it can deliver a sustainably higher growth rate, whereas really it can just manage cycles and get the growth rate up for a while. But, you know, the long-term growth rate has to do with innovation, um, how much, how many hours people want to work, what the population growth is, whether you allow immigrants in, um, and all that stuff, right? So the Fed could be overtaxed, and that would just create uh, an even greater likelihood of a, price, a crisis of, you know, political legitimacy if it disappointed those expectations. So I'm a bit wary of that. I'm inclined to say, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency should protect the environment, and the Food and Drug Administration should protect the quality of pharmaceuticals and the safety of food. Um, and, and they shouldn't be addressing inequality. That's not their remit. And equally with the Fed, it's not the remit of the Fed to do something about inequality. The one place where I do see um, the debate shifting in an appropriate way is actually on the environment, though, because the Fed does regulate banks, and banks can be pushed to recognize environmental risks in their accounts. Um, so if you are a lender and you're lending to uh, an oil project, say, which um, might lose money if uh, environmental protection legislation were to get tougher, uh, or you are going to lend money to something where climate change could, you know, cause a, a, a flooding or something which would undermine the viability of the project you're lending to. That stuff should show up in your accounts because it's a legitimate business risk that shareholders ought to know about. And certainly the Bank of England is pushing that shift, and I think that would be a global shift for central banks in being more aware of climate risk. It seems, Sarah, that, that, that all the conversations start pointing in the direction of your expertise and politics in the Fed, whether that's a matter of congressional oversight or the political impact of, of what we have basically is a low inflation, low growth period, um, and also the issues that, that were brought up by Bruce and Sebastian. So, well, I think one thing to be clear to drive home is this is... Uh, in many ways, a recurring problem for the Fed, right? Even in just the short term, if we think about the response, the Fed's response to financial crisis, and uh, Bernanke came out of that crisis and he would often say, monetary policy is not a panacea. It, it can't solve all our problems. And the, I think the refrain came to be, well, given how stalemated Congress was on fiscal policy responses, the refrain came to be, well, monetary policy is the only game in town. And you hear that again, right? So under Jay Powell, after we now we see stalemate on whether or not there'll be another round of pandemic relief, you hear him saying it in his own terms, in his own words here, but his is lending isn't spending. It's almost this sort of dire cry for lawmakers and the president to take up the baton and don't leave economic recovery in the hands of the Fed, right? For all the reasons that uh, Bruce and Sebastian have uh, laid out for us. Um, and that that's the Fed sort of standing up and signaling and pointing a finger about, back to Congress and saying, look, this, this is way beyond our capacity here uh, as a lender of last resort. Um, but if you think about it, if it's a cycle, if we keep seeing this over time, it, one has to wonder that lawmakers have a political incentive just to blame the Fed and keep deflecting blame from their own uh, different disagreements about whether or not and how fiscal policy should be used. Right. Now, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we. Uh, I would... Lawmakers may yet turn on a dime when we see uh, if there's a change uh, generated by the election. Uh, but um, suffice it to say, I think uh, that that dynamic is pretty recurrent uh, over over decades of Fed history. Yeah, you, know, you see, when, when Congress has difficulty, one of our 
whether it's a political crisis or not sort of depends on one's perspective, but it's certainly one of the characteristics of our politics is that is that Congress finds it difficult to resolve issues and then the president takes advantage of it in the regulatory sphere, Democrat or Republican. Uh, the courts, they aren't really taking advantage of it, but they're you turn to the courts for certain types of decisions. And then in the economic sphere, it ends up being the Fed since they're less politically charged and they can act in ways uh, unilaterally that the Congress can't, um, that is more difficult for the political institutions um, to do. Uh, so uh, uh, so it, and that comes around to the point of, well, what what opportunity are the is the Congress missing or are our political institutions missing right now at this stage in the economic crisis that's been caused by the pandemic? Um, go ahead, Sarah. Well, I, again, and a nod to your point that people disagree and uh, the parties disagree and internally in the parties disagree about whether and how to extend really the CARES Act response uh, that Congress generated uh, relatively quickly and efficiently uh, in the immediate wake of uh, the COVID outbreaks in, back, in, back in March. Um, so I, I think there's a whole host of uh, possibilities here and there's support for individual pieces, right? Uh, cash payments to individual, um, doing something about extending unemployment, uh, extended and enhanced unemployment benefits again, more money for schools, um, the controversial issue of how much, if at all, to help out state and local governments. Right. There's a whole range here of uh, economic needs, uh, and it's sometimes hard to, to disentangle. Oh, particularly Democrats have generally been in favor of more, more relief here. Um, Republicans have been a bit divided, uh, Senate Republicans in particular. Those facing voters in swing states are quite keen on sending more aid back uh, to their states. Um, other Republicans uh, not facing voters for a while, whether that is political, electoral, or whether it's ideological, um, hard, hard to dis disentangle in, at, a, you know, at a moment in, in time. But those disagreements have uh, left uh, a lot of people um, still out of work with limited benefits. And as people call it, this K-shaped recovery where those on top uh, do quite well and those at the bottom of the income ladders uh, haven't, been, uh, haven't been on the road to, uh, to a recovery. I think when we, go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah, when we think about you know the opportunities that Congress faces at this moment in the COVID economy, it's worth just going back to this issue of the national debt. So, you know, it's fine to increase the national debt when interest rates are very low. As I said before, it's risky if interest rates were to go up. But one thing you can say is that it's less risky to increase the spending the spending is going to likely raise the growth rate, right? Because what we care about is the ratio of debt to GDP. It's not the debt itself. It's like, how big is your economy and how much money is that generating with which to pay back debt? So if you can borrow at, you know, half a percent or something, and then spend that money on a national investment that could increase the growth rate by more than that, um, you're actually reducing the future uh, debt to GDP ratio. And so I'm thinking about things like investments in basic science, uh, which I think has been shortchanged, particularly the hard sciences over the past generation. I'm thinking about uh, potential climate related investments that could kickstart mm -hmm. a green economy. That's obviously good for climate uh, change mitigation, but it also could be good for uh, economic growth. Education generally, I think, is a good bet. And there's a big infrastructure deficit even beyond the issue of green infrastructure. So I think, you know, when we are weighing up the risks and benefits of increased uh, spending and a future CARES Act, we ought to bear in mind that some kinds of spending are growth enhancing, and those are sort of the safest in terms of long-term fiscal health. No, I think that's absolutely right. And um, and there, there could be, there, there are quite often, there are a bunch of forms of public spending that are going to drive growth. I guess I do want to uh, pick up um, something. I think, um, John, maybe you said it, uh, the, the K-shaped recovery uh, where, you know, some people uh, in the higher income um, uh, brackets are, are doing okay and, and the real brunt of the, 
of the COVID uh, collapse is being borne by uh, lower income households. Uh, because I do think that, that the, one of the things we always have to keep in mind when we talk about growth, um, as, as uh, Sebastian right, rightfully was uh, saying, is there's a question of the distribution of the benefits of growth. And, and that is a political issue in the United States. And so even if we all agree that, that uh, growth is a, is a good thing, and, and, and if the growth is fast enough, it certainly uh, justifies increased borrowing. If the rate of growth is higher than the rate of borrowing, it's, it's a great goal for America. So let's go for it. Uh, but then the question that we will come back to is, how are the fruits of that growth distributed? And, it, and if they are not evenly distributed, then you, you just have a growing number of people who are not benefiting from growth. And growth sounds like a win-win, but, but it need not be. Um, if if there's uh, a really uneven distribution of the benefits of that, and that's why I think the 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 issue of inequality is is going to be nibbling around all of these things. Even though certainly uh, for the Fed as a as an organization, that's a really new problem for them to worry about. You know, they're just not well equipped, or historically, it's not part of their legacy to worry about these things. But I do think that the political reality is that even if you push for growth. Uh, someone is going to say, well, well, who benefits from growth? And are, are we leaving populations behind? In which case, politically, they're not going to be so excited by growth because it's just not going to uh, uh, benefit their their households and their pocketbooks. Well, what's, what's interesting from the, you know, here we are sitting in the last month before the election, and uh, there's a lot of pain out there and a lot of people are suffering because of the economic conditions. And, you know, one of the things you hope for in a, in a, in a, in a republic is that, when when the can when the, the politicians are forced to confront the voters that that they would see that pain and and all these appealing things you're talking about uh, would would find its way into law would find their way into law but of course that's not doesn't seem to be happening yet now maybe maybe it will you know we're taping this on October fifth and maybe by the time people view this uh, ten days from now maybe that'll be different but that is one of the interesting things that's happening now is that the the institutions were quite responsive early on and much less so now as we get closer to the election. Is there a reason for that in particular? Well, it's easier to explain why they reacted immediately in, in congressional time, right? Immediately throughout the month of, uh, month of March before they ended in the, in the CARES Act. And I, I think there's often this notion, they say, well, in, in, in these crises times, we, we did the right thing. We met the need. We uh, knew what had to be done. But in, in reality, I think lawmakers say that, but what they really is motivating them is not to be blamed uh, for the crisis, right? You don't want to be the party that's saying no when it's clear the consequences is, is, un, is unsustainable, right? When if you don't do anything, that, that leaving it that way is, is really un, untenable. So avoiding blame can motivate a lot of what looks like um, happy bipartisanship. But with other crises, not usually with other crises, as the further and further you get from that impact, whether it's September 11th or uh, depression, right? The further and further you get from that, that motivation to avoid blame starts starts to uh, dis dissipate, at least from the party's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but w one one wonders, but certainly seems that one or both parties have decided that they want they're equally well off, they might think, with an issue to campaign on as well as to law and mm -hmm. benefits to bring back back to voters. Um, but as you said, uh, October still <laughs> still has some possibility. Yeah. So uh, Bruce and, and Sebastian, I want to give you, you all an opportunity to uh, speak to that or any last words you might have before we run out of time. Well, I think uh, I think Sarah is absolutely right. There there is uh, uh, there's some. Um, political maneuvering that's happening that's all about, uh, you know, what can you take credit for and what can you avoid blame for? And, and that does drive uh, um, some, uh, some of this. Uh, just to, to pick up on the big package of things that, that Sarah was, was enumerating that were part of the CARES Act, or I think uh, that also Sebastian was, uh, was pointing out, there are ways of, of dealing with inequality where you don't actually have to talk about it if it's too contentious an issue. Um, you know, it's too hot uh, and it looks like you're, you know, being captured by AOC and the squad. 
Um, but, but if you look at some of the elements in the, the, the package of, of uh, interventions, if you look at, you know, simply uh, mailing everyone a check for $1,200, well, we know that a $1,200 check that comes into a household is going to make an enormous, uh, have an enormous benefit among the poorer and low income households. Uh, so this kind of across the board measure is, is going to have this um, very positive effect among uh, lower middle income households than among the well off. And, and so, um, and, and so even though people aren't using the, the I word inequality, um, they're advocating for a popular measure that could actually help people who are worse off uh, immediately. Uh, so I think there's ways politically in which people are being responsive to some of these um, inequality issues without necessarily being uh, completely explicit about it. Um, if you were to, um, you know, do something like uh, support education, where you think about all the households that have been, um, you know, really challenged uh, by the disappearance of, of the, the public schools or daycare, uh, you know, there's a lot of households that are just getting massacred. And if you're well off, uh, you can hire a private nanny or there's, a, you know, uh, private workarounds. But if you're a part of the general population, uh, some kind of government uh, federal measure that really spoke to the financial situation of the schools and the preschools and uh, allowed allowed folks to you know get their kids out of their house or get someone else to look after them. Again, I think this would be uh, a, a, something that that speaks to an inequality of issue, uh, an inequality issue, but not, without necessarily saying so much because maybe that's a little too hot. So that's uh, I guess I'll stop there. Sebastian, you get the last, last word. Okay, well, um, Sarah and Bruce have spoken well about the politics, so I'll um, offer a concluding thought on something a bit different, which is, I think, with respect to Fed policy, we do have to keep in the back of our minds the question of financial stability, which came up at the start of the conversation. You know, the uh, 2001 recession was triggered by the collapse in the NASDAQ uh, tech index the year before. Uh, which created this collapse in investment spending and fed through ultimately into an, a shallow recession in 2001. Then you had the huge subprime mortgage collapse, which created the next recession. Uh, and so we have two examples, um, two of the last three, the third one being the COVID recession, uh, where the downturn was caused not by inflation or by any conventional you know, business cycle uh, maladjustment, it was caused instead by financial maladjustment. And I think the super low interest rates that we have at the moment uh, do create risks. There's one kind of risk, which is that you get an enormous bubble, which is okay, but then it might pop and that's not so okay. But the other kind of risk is that when capital is effectively priced at near zero, right? You can borrow it for almost nothing. Um, it won't be allocated with great care. It's just not valuable enough for people to to focus on the discrimination between should I lend to this company or that company? Should I buy this stock or that stock? Everything's going up. All the loans are basically being backstopped by the Fed if you're thinking about um, you know, bond market form of lending. So I think there's, there's a risk of less alert capital markets. And we know in history that that can negatively affect the performance of an economy down the line. It's not top of mind uh, right in uh, you know this year in 2020 but i think coming into 2021 uh, we may have to focus on it more than we would have chosen well i want to thank you all for joining us uh here uh, at the library although not actually physically for our conversations on the future of democracy series we wish you well and we hope actually to see you physically at the library before too too long take care to all of you